<laughs> Sorry about that. So we're here to talk about cyber insurance this morning. I want to introduce your moderator this morning. Uh, Zakia Ali uh, is the executive director of Delaware IT Industry Council and is leading efforts to build and expand ex inclusive tech talent pipelines in Delaware. She is an accomplished leader with an impressive track record of success in both the public and private sectors. With over 20 years experience as a workforce development practitioner and human resource professional, Zakia utilizes a systems thinking approach to develop innovative solutions that provide businesses with a pipeline of qualified talent and create avenues for overlooked populations to achieve economic independence through sustainable employment. She graduated with honors from Westchester University with a Bachelor of Science in Marketing, minor in Psychology, and earned a Master of Leadership Development from Pennsylvania State University, Great Valley. Zakia also holds a Senior Certified Professional designation from SHRM, a Professional Human Resource Management credential from Villanova University, and is a graduate of the Women's Leadership Ser Series through Temple University's Fox School of Business Center for Executive Education. Zakia? Great, thank you so much, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cyber Insurance When All Else Fails. Uh, happy to be here with you all today, and before we get started, I'm going to allow our panelists to introduce themselves, and I'm gonna start here with uh, Kevin. Thank you, good morning, everyone. So I'm Kevin Violet um, with a firm called RT Specialty. We're a wholesale insurance broker. Um, personally, I specialize in network security and privacy liability insurance. Um, lead a team up in the Northeast uh, for our organization. Uh, been on uh, with the organization for 12 years. Prior to that, I was a, an insurance underwriter, so kind of seeing both sides of the coin on the brokerage side and the underwriting side. And um, I, just like a lot of the other folks here, I, I spent a lot of time um, you know, educating clients about um, you know, cybersecurity risks as it relates to insurance topics. And I'm David Risa from USI Insurance Services. Um, you may hear from my accent, I'm not quite from around here, but I did graduate when I spent a year at Newark High School, just down the road there. Um, I was imported from New Zealand in 2014, um, been working in cyber insurance since 2007, speaking on the topic, like Kevin said, um, in multiple countries and um, to multiple audiences. I deal with public entities, real estate, and professional services primarily um, with the middle market and larger. Uh, my name's John Kojo. I'm an independent uh, agent here in the Mid-Atlantic States, and I work with uh, companies, smaller uh, businesses, from anywhere from one person operation up to about 100 in, uh, employees. And uh, we work uh, with them in securing their business insurance uh, which includes uh, uh, cyber liability insurance. Great, thank you so much. And we have um, a ton of questions that we're gonna get through. I know we're starting just a few minutes behind, but we're gonna also leave time for you to ask the panelists some questions as well. So any business that uses technology or collects data of any kind is at risk of a cyber attack. And the results of a cyber attack can be disastrous. Recent studies suggest that the average cost of a data breach in the U.S. is $9.4 million. Without securing a quality cyber policy, most businesses do not have adequate insurance coverage following a data breach. Cyber insurance can be essential in helping companies recover after a data breach with costs that can include business disruption, revenue loss, equipment damages, legal fees, PR expenses, forensic analysis, and costs associated with legally mandated notifications. So I will jump right in and ask our panel, what are the key controls or minimum requirements that companies should have in place in order to even obtain cyber insurance? And we'll start with you, Kevin. Yeah, sure. So that, I mean, obviously, you know, nowadays with uh, ransomware attacks in particular and, and other social engineering attacks uh, being so prevalent, you know, we're seeing insurance companies really uh, sharpen up what they're looking for from a security control perspective where, you know, a number of years ago it was, you know, three questions on an application, get a quote and you're good to go. Obviously that's changed. So the, the big ones that, that come into play from a minimum um, security perspective, I mean, multi-factor authentication, um, obviously in a number of different areas, uh, remote access to the network, um, access to uh, email, um, you know, MFA protecting your backups and, and, and almost more importantly, MFA uh, and protection of uh, privileged accounts, privileged user accounts. 
Um, the other things that come to mind, um, uh, strong backup controls, uh, ensuring that your backups are not, not stored on network, or, or at least a, a portion of your backups are segregated, um, ideally immutable, um, and, and, you know, and controls around that. So the, in, in the event of, a, of an attack, uh, if your network is compromised, you potentially have the ability to recover from your backups. Um, and then, you know, the human element is always a, a huge uh, concern, uh, as everyone knows. So employee training programs, ideally with some level of phishing exercise um, to ensure that your employees are, are really, um, you know, doing what they need to do and being educated as to, you know, uh, you know potential compromises that, that, that uh, you know, from these phishing emails that might come into play. Um, there's others as well as organizations get larger, um, you know, things like uh, endpoint detection and response is becoming very popular. Um, and even if you get, you know, very large, you know, organizations in excess of, say, a billion dollars in revenue, you know, we're seeing, you know, th things going as far as, you know, privilege access management tools that are in place to help kind of control all of the, you know, the privileged accounts that organizations are using. So th those are the ones that, that come to mind for me. And probably, I don't know, if David and John, if you yeah. have thoughts as no, well. No, I totally agree with those. Um, the three in particular that I would say out of those are multi-factor authentication, endpoint detection and response and the backups. Um, and when we're talking about resilient backups, like we know a lot of them like to see the air gapped backups yep. or they like to see if it is offline, making sure, getting back to Kevin's comment on the multi-factor authentication, that you have that for access to any of your backups offline. But we need to make sure that there is always an immutable backup. That's a huge part that a lot of our carriers want to say. And then in addition, we were just having a chat about this before, um, a lot of these insurers now, they're insure techs, they're actually scanning all of your public facing assets, the IP addresses, the websites, um, before they'll agree whether they're going to insure you or not. And sometimes that opens up certain issues that maybe you weren't aware of, maybe you don't think they're as big a deal as the actual insurer does. Um, so we need to coordinate responses with your IT teams back to the insurance companies. Or there's also certain solution, web application firewalls. Um, there's one out there. I don't think I'm allowed to say a specific name from on stage, but we can talk after the fact that you can put all of your public facing assets behind their product. And then when the scan is done, it looks totally clean to the insurance company and then you can move forward um, with the insurance purchase. Again, we were saying, we would say you should leave up your, um, if that's how you get through the underwriting process, then we would say you should also leave the shields up for the entirety of the term, just so you're not running into any sort of insurance fraud allegations or anything like that. Um, we don't work for the insurance companies, we work for you guys as the intermediaries, so we're allowed to say when they, there are situations where they'll look at the language to see if there's a situation not to pay out on the claim. So we work with you to make sure that doesn't occur um, beforehand. Uh, yeah, for a small business owner to get them to use passwords that aren't password, um, <laughs> I think that's a, that's a big step. Um, to encrypt their emails, that's uh, another important step that uh, insurance companies are looking for. And two-factor uh, authentication is a, is a must. And one thing I wanted to add to your opening um, comments was for the small business owner, if they're attacked they're, they're, and they don't have, they'll probably be out of business, unfortunately. You know, from one to 100, it's so hard to survive. So, um, um, you know, I mean, it's just a fact of life. The, um, but I think everything else that we mentioned here, the one thing that I can tell you, um, the, uh, we're seeing it, I'm seeing it now in, in uh, the carriers that I represent, they are actually going in and monitoring your network. So they're being a little more proactive. Um, I think they realize that um, because of the claims, they don't really trust small business owners. So um, they're trying to be as proactive and I think you're gonna see more and more products coming to market where uh, they will help with the monitoring because they, they wanna do everything they possibly can to prevent um, you know, an attack on your business.
Yeah. And, and if I could just put my HR hat on for a minute, one of the other uh, controls and requirements that uh, may be looked at is certainly making sure that uh, terminated or separated employees no longer have access to the systems after their last day of work. That's a key control that should certainly be in place. But thank you for those insights. Mm -hmm. So clearly it is important for businesses of all sizes and across all industries to have cyber insurance but all companies are not the same. So if an IT director needed to prioritize the implementation of new technologies or processes, and understanding that many businesses operate under tight budgets, uh, what would you suggest they sort of prioritize first, second, or third? And we'll start with you, David. Okay, <clears throat> I would go back to my comment, um, and I'm taking this from another insurer we're working with recently. They want to see multi-factor authentication as one, um, I wouldn't even necessarily call it low-hanging fruit because I know any time you add tension to a process, people are less likely to want to use it. But that is what they want to see. And to Kevin's point, they want to see it for um, admin accounts, they want to see it for remote access, and they want to see it for emails. Those are the minimums. Some insurers are starting to go beyond that now that I've talked to, and they want to see it for internal and external access, so multi-factor authentication all over the place which it is a pain. I know a lot of you IT people here, and I imagine you'd get quite a bit of pushback if you started requiring multi-factor authentication every time someone signs in. But start the process now in terms of warming people up to expect it to be coming down the line. Um, endpoint detection and response, a huge one. You guys are a lot more technical than us, but just the fact that there's constant monitoring of the endpoints and there's that algorithm looking for when it's going to be something used outside of the normal usage and you can actually take that and lock it away from the rest of the system because what you'll notice is most of these controls resilient backups is a third so mfa endpoint detection response resilient backups and could somebody guess probably why those are the three things what do you think insurance companies are getting at when they're targeting those three issues sorry Storage, you Storage because of ransomware. So they want to make sure that if you get hit with a ransomware attack, you have a viable backup and you're making it as hard as possible for those people to get into your system. So MFA, endpoint detection response, resilient backups, there are others, of course, but if you had to prioritize, those would be the first three. Yeah, John, and what should the small businesses prioritize, especially if they have you know tight or limited budgets? Yeah. Uh, there, there are some third-party vendors out there that uh, that sell cyber services and testing, but there um, you can get a phishing test for free. So uh, there's certain you know so you can scout around to uh, certain vendors and, and they'll they'll throw out a you know a, a biscuit or a bone and um, uh, I, I encourage you know whenever you can test that's that's really important. Um, and uh, it, you know it, this type of testing really doesn't cost the small business owner any monies. Uh, you said something I wanted to follow up on, but uh, uh, the oh um, the uh, uh, phishing. Uh, if you can talk to your employees about phishing, and um, th that's the number one uh, way that. Uh, these criminals penetrate um, and, and through email. And then I heard earlier this morning, the, I think the the uh, first speaker or the intro speaker was right on um, for a personal uh, your personal email to get into your your business. Uh, well, get into your personal assets because that's very um, and there and, and insurance companies and carriers like the home insurance carriers are coming out with a, a, a much beefier cyber protection for the homeowner. Uh, but that, that, just recognizing emails, you know, if there's no phone number, it misspellings, um, the logo's off, you, you know, if you just, just maybe take some, you can go over, go like Google it and get some pictures and just share it with your employees, say, hey, this is not a Microsoft logo, look at the difference here. And it, it uh, I think that would be, um, that would be an important step, and again, it wouldn't cost it cost any any yep. money. But uh, it's um, phishing in email is, is is you have to be very as a small business owner, you have to be diligent in in um, 
uh, you know, seeing those uh, potential attacks. Yeah, and that's certainly the low-hanging fruit for, for businesses is the employee training piece. So, Kevin, anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think they, you know, both uh, David and John kind of covered it, right? I think, you know, as far as from a cost perspective, the employee training um, and potential fishing exercises tends to be a lower cost solution that can reap some real benefits. Mm -hmm. um, I think certainly multi-factor authentication is, is high on the priority list. Um, again, we're looking for insurance coverage. The carriers are definitely all mandating MFA to be in place. So for, from a starting point to get in there, that's, that's definitely um, high on the priority list. And, and then probably third on there, and we haven't really talked about it yet, but um, you know, ensuring you have a secure email gateway in place. Uh, again, a lot of these attacks are coming through uh, through email, so um, you know those can be done and implemented. You know, depending on your organization with with low cost. And so, you know, we know budgeting is always an issue, uh, particularly anybody in the public entity space. It's it's we recognize that that's not an easy thing to do. So, so looking at, at some of these solutions that, that start off with a lower cost, um, it might be a good place to start. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to add is updating uh, your software. That, that, that's an expe I mean, it doesn't cost you anything, but you, you'd be surprised at uh, how many situations um, we find that they have not updated for years. Uh, they might be still working on an old operating system where they could have upgraded. Um, that that is really um, that's really important yep. and then passwords strong passwords you got to have strong passwords just yep. make it a little bit difficult for the for the for the criminal yeah I like the term bad actors earlier so excellent points now while it's important for businesses to take precautions certainly insurers have a vested interest in making sure that clients do not suffer breaches or losses so what resources do the insurers provide to help companies minimize risks? And we'll start with you, John. Oh, um, they have a, uh, almost every carrier that we represent in the small business market has a great loss control team. So when you become a, a client of the carrier, you can contact them and they have a, a, a team of professionals that will be able to answer your questions and help you and guide you uh, through some of the things that we talked about today. Um, also coming to market in a small business mar uh, place is um, some, some um, monitoring. They want to come in and monitor your system. Um, uh, I think you mentioned that you know, before they sign you up, they're going to check your website, make sure it's secure, and uh, uh, they'll do some preliminary checks. But now once you become a client, they're gonna, they want to be more of a of a partner with you to in this in this cyber threat uh, area to help you through and, and try to prevent um, you know hacking in your system. Yep, and complimentary assessments are very helpful if you can take advantage of them and don't be put off by the fact that someone's assessing and looking at your systems. It's really to prevent those losses. So, Kevin, anything to add there related to what the um, insurers are doing to minimize risks? Sure. So, so we have to keep in mind that uh, insurance companies, when you're when you're writing when they're writing your cyber insurance, your interests are ultimately aligned in the sense that they don't want you to suffer a breach that's going to cost incur costs, right? Because one, obviously, you don't want that to happen. They don't as well because ultimately they're the ones going to be paying out on it. So, they have a vested interest in providing resources to organizations to help. You know, kind of minimize, mitigate some of those risks. You know, things like, you know, obviously, as as John mentioned, um, kind of these external non-invasive security scans. You know, they're all doing them. They do them not only from an underwriting perspective, but also the perspective of trying to be informative. There's oftentimes some false positives there, and you know, there's there's kind of kinks to work out, if you will. But um, but you know, overall, there's there's some benefit there. But you know, things like you know, incident response plan reviews. Um, a lot of these carriers, including us. Uh, the brokerage firms will often have, you know, IRP plans that um, are available and, and templates and things like that. So if you don't have one in place, good place to start. Um, some of the insurance carriers offer like virtual CISO services um, that can be utilized regardless if you have your own CISO or not. Sometimes if you have your own CISO, it can be just another point of contact to help bounce ideas off of. If you don't have your own CISO, it's a great you know opportunity to kind of utilize some of them not all the carriers have that but but some do for sure um, as part and going back to the scanning a little bit um, as part of that scanning oftentimes if you're a policyholder 
um, if there's new vulnerabilities that that present themselves throughout the year um, you know log4j was a great example um, you know the Kaseya breach I mean there was a number of them Microsoft Exchange when they had their vulnerabilities um, they you know can often see if you're utilizing some of those tools log4j is a little more tricky just because of how that works but um, and oftentimes what they'll do is they'll provide you know hey, a notice hey we recognize that you're using Microsoft Exchange um, on-prem you know here's here's the the updated patch from Microsoft um, you know uh, please try to implement it if you can it doesn't impact your policy while you're in the middle of the policy period but you know it's just trying to be another way to be informative uh, some of these you might already be aware of others you might not so um, some of those resources help kind of you know with the attempt to, to mitigate the risk as much as possible yeah yeah, and I'll just add a couple of things. Um, they usually have a portal that you can sign into. So whether that be your insurance company or your broker that gives educational articles, um, news updates, tips, tricks, some phishing um, emails you can come use yourself and send them out and how to do it internally. <clears throat> and then um, if you find out that you do need some extra help, you can quite often access service providers at discounted rates through your in insurer or your broker. Yep, absolutely. And those, you know, resources are available. So ask your insurer, you know, go on the site and take advantage of those. Uh, we know that despite precautions and utilizing resources, breaches and issues can still happen. And just this year alone, we've seen data breaches at DoorDash, Samsung, uh, Uber, American Airlines, just to name a few. So what are the most common claims that we're seeing nowadays? And we'll start with you, Kevin. Uh, I mean, the, the really the big two are ransomware and social engineering, um, or, or you know, funds transfer fraud. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, ransomware kind of goes without saying, right? There's a there's a, a, a material uh, benefit to the attacker uh, in the form of payment, um, even if their their success rate is low, the demands are high, right? So if they if they get one in ten organizations to pay a ransom. Um, that's fueling the fire. It's funding their own um, their own efforts, um, and so um, I think I think for sure um, that's you know we're still seeing those ransom claims. Luckily, um, recently it's it's ticked down a bit. Um, me, I think my view is likely because resiliency has gotten better um, over the past few years. We're seeing less firms willing to pay a ransom, which is great. Um, and they're not paying the ransom because the resiliency is much better. So, but, but ransomware, bar none, top source of claims right now. Um, social engineering fraud, um, kind of, I'd put it at second, but, you know, that's, that's increasing. Um, you know, it, it goes back to that funds transfer uh, concern, right? They, they go in, they request a payment, um, you know, impersonating an employee of the organization, they request the financial institution to make a payment. Next thing you know, you know, two hundred fifty thousand dollars, five hundred thousand dollars, you know, you name it, goes out the door, and and that money's disappeared. So, it's that kind of low hanging fruit. We still see you know privacy breaches occur, but for when privacy breaches occur and, and personal data is compromised, they then now need to sell that data to to recoup their their um, their money. And let's be honest, you know. Criminals are pretty fickle. They don't want to put the effort into doing that. So, um, you know, so they just inherently go to the the, quick, the the quickest buck they can get, and those are probably the two that I would put on the in that yeah. top of the list. Yeah, I completely agree. The only thing I'd say is I was listening to a podcast the other day, and the cynic said that they thought the um, reason the ransomwares are ticking down is because of uh, I don't. I'm smiling because I'll cry. What's happening in Russia and the Ukraine? Um, they think they're distracted at the moment mm. and that a lot of their resources are being sent to there or that they think they're getting bad enough press anyway. So his point was it's too early to say whether this was a trend so we can't get complacent in our protections. I hope you're right. I want to believe what Kevin said, that we're just getting better at it and that um, people are not paying out the claims. But um, keep an eye on that. But totally agree. Ransomware and social engineering. Right. And if you have a, a secure backup, then ransomware will, will eventually go away, I would think. But uh, you, you just need to make sure you have a secure way of backing up so that if you do get threatened, that you can continue, you can continue your business in the next hour or so, um, you know, with the data that you have, you know, backed up. 
Yeah, and from a social engineering standpoint, again, we can't stress this enough, you know, making sure that your employees are aware of the types of breaches and, uh, you know, phishing uh, emails that can come through so they can also be a line of defense as well and speak up when they see something that doesn't look right as well. And on that too, yeah. uh, I encourage my small business owners and employees to report the phishing. Like mm -hmm. if you're in a Microsoft environment, there, there's, a, there's a little tab on top of your email and you can just hit the button, it'll report it and then wipe it right out. And, um, you know, so that, you know, because if there's like 10,000 of those emails going mm -hmm. out. So you, if you can get Microsoft in as a team partner, they can, they can you know, try to find out who's doing this and maybe stop putting a stop to it as well. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and so in light of the cyber climate and uptick in data breaches, um, what trends are we seeing with cyber insurers and where is cyber insurance market, where's the cyber insurance market heading? And we'll start with you, David. All right, um, it's hard is the honest answer. Premiums are going up 74% is what we're seeing year on year. Um, some insurers are reducing coverage, so there's a co-insurance clause, I'll explain what that means in a second, on ransomware that they're putting into place. So if you don't have the controls in place, or if the insurance company basically is kind of wants to give you a go away quote, they don't want to write the cyber insurance anymore, they'll put a co-insurance clause onto your policy. And some of the ones I've seen are 50%. So if you had a ransomware or cyber extortion event, you would pay not only your deductible, you would pay half of whatever the claim was up to your policy limit. So if you had a $2 million limit, you, let's say you had a $50,000 deductible and you had a 50% co-insurance clause, you'd pay your 50% um, deduct, sorry, $50,000 deductible and then you'd pay $1 million of that $2 million loss and the insurance company would only pay the other half. So we're seeing that now. That's particularly still true in public entity space, sorry to tell you. Um, so you have to get out nice and early with your public entities, make sure that you are show differentiating yourselves from the other public entities. Unfortunately, public entities, professional services, um, some of the more local financial institutions are seen as soft targets by the bad actors overseas because they know you have a lot of rich information but maybe not the same budget that the other organizations have to protect, so they go for the easiest path. Um, schools is the latest one. Um, there's a range of attacks. The FBI put out an alert for schools in the United States. They're being targeted at the moment. So that's what we're seeing. But in saying that, there are some insurers that believe they're getting better in terms of underwriting risk. So we are seeing more competition coming into the market for the right risks. So it's not all doom and gloom. I'm seeing a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel for the right risks. Great. Anything to add on uh, where the market is headed, uh, John or Kevin? Uh, no, I think it's he's spot on with uh, with that information. Yeah, I think uh, you know what I would add to that. Um, what what I think the insurance marketplace has gotten better with is is helping insureds become better risks, right? Mm -hmm. And so. You know, overall, we've seen controls uh, with organizations improving, right? Which, frankly, needed to happen. Um, you know, what we saw, you know, two, three, four years ago was a highly competitive market that, um, you know, insurance carriers were looking for as much market share as they, they could get. Obviously, all these attacks hit and, and you know, they had a major market correction, right? I think a lot of folks, when you spoke to them a number of years ago, is how are they pricing this so inexpensively? That mm -hmm. was the, the motto for a while. It just doesn't make any sense. Something eventually is going to change. Well, it obviously has at this point, right? And so, um, you know, what we've, what's kind of come out of that is overall better risks. Sure, prices are up. Um, we're probably, as David mentioned, we're probably getting near that, you know, point where it becomes unaffordable, so prices can't continue to go up. They will likely level off and, and might start coming down um, in the somewhat near future. Um, and so, so I think you know, from that perspective, you know, we're gonna we're, we're gonna see more of a moderation of of the of the cyber insurance marketplace overall um, in the near future. Um, where I, I see long term, we see a lot of concerns that insurance carriers have is on the systemic risk side. Right, you have a, a whether it's a nation state or otherwise, you have this attack that affects 
you know, numerous organizations, not that dissimilar from property, right? Look what's going on in Florida right now and, and how much exposure these insurance companies have from all these different uh, insureds they have on their books. Think of the same thing from a cyber perspective. You've got this major attack that affects you know, a large book of business for these insurance carriers. That can really have an impact. I mean, what a lot of folks don't re, you know, think of or, or maybe even know is that these insurance car carriers will buy reinsurance on their book of business. So basically, for large catastrophic type exposures, they, they buy insurance themselves to protect against this catastrophic type loss. Well, reinsurance tend to drive what the overall view of the market is because how they price their risk kind of reflects back down into the normal insurance market. And so the reinsurers in particular are really, really concerned about systemic risk. So I think we'll probably start seeing insurance carriers, and we already are with a few of them, starting to try to cap um, overall exposure on the systemic risk side. And, and there's going to be different ways that that might happen, but I could see that like the next thing to come is kind of some changes in the systemic, systemic risk side. Great, thank you. So certainly the market is headed in some interesting directions. And again, while it's important to have cyber insurance, we hope to never have to use it or make a claim. Uh, certainly companies don't want to lose twice, uh, first with the cyber attack and then with a denied claim. So are insurers actually denying claims? And if so, what do you see as the main reason why claims are denied? And we'll start with Kevin. Uh, yeah, I mean, Claims get denied from time to time, um, and you could say that with any line of insurance. Um, I think the, the the two biggest areas where I see claim denials, and, it's, and I think a lot of folks sitting here are probably thinking, oh, well, it's something along our controls and the controls not being in place. It's not really that. What we're seeing is, interestingly enough, um, you know, we're seeing late reporting issues, right? You, uh, you, you have an incident, right? I, I don't like to use the term breach unless it's it's an actual breach, but say we have an incident, we start investigating, we start incur incurring all of these costs, we bring in outside, outside experts to you know, do some forensics, and we might bring in ex outside legal to help with you know, determining if we've got any obligations contractually or, or legally or otherwise. Um, and then, oh, we have a cyber insurance policy, we forgot to report that. Now we go and report that after incurring all these costs there's a potential for that claim to be denied just because of how far down the road you've gotten. So, so number one, you know, if there's an incident, you know, the insurance carriers are, are they're wanting you to report that. Even if, even if initially they're saying, all right, we're going to take a back seat. We're going to let you run with it initially because you seem like you have a handle on it. Just get it in. Um, that, that can really help preserve coverage that you might have available. Um, and, and the other, and, and um, this comes into play, unfortunately, a lot. We see this a lot when, say, uh, you know, real estate entities where there's really named insureds, right? So the policy will respond to the insured that's listed on the policy. And often these policies will include any kind of subsidiaries that you might have. A lot of organizations will have, you know, uh, an individual that might own a bunch of entities um, and they might not fit into some nice org chart. Um, making sure those are scheduled on the policy where needed are really important. We get, you know, it, it, you think it's more like a housekeeping item, but it's something that comes up. And those are really, for me, when I've seen claim denials, those are the two that I've seen come up the most often. And again, it's not necessarily, hey, you know, we, 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 you know, we didn't patch this, uh, this system today. Well, that's why you bought insurance coverage. You know, hopefully you, you patch it next time. It's really these kind of two other items that I just mentioned from what I've been seeing. Yeah, well, that's interesting because the claims made nature, a lot of those cyber policies too, making sure that you get it in a timely manner so you're not trying to get it into the next when you became aware of it. Um, yep. So claims made, right, Jim? You've got to be careful. Oh, and also um, you were talking about the systemic risk. The Jim actually sent me an article recently about Lloyd's putting the exclusion on for um, across all their policies, the terrorism, so interesting. Um, but in terms of claim denials, um, thankfully, is that wood? Mm -hmm. I haven't had it myself, but um, when you're filling out these applications, there's actually a line that says they become part of your insurance policy. So if you're materially misrepresenting something in those applications, you say you have a control that you don't have, the insurance company says, well, we wouldn't have insured you if you didn't have that control. If it's a material misrepresentation, they could technically say, we're not going to cover you for that because you basically lied to us. Now, it could be 
inadvertent, and we can have a chat about some of those, and maybe we'll pay a portion of it. Um, but those are important elements to think of, going back to when we were talking about if you're going to shield when they're doing scanning ahead of time to make sure you pass the test initially, making sure that you're representing yourself properly, um, accu accurately um, to the organization. So what we recommend is when you're going through the process, talk directly to your IT department and put them in touch with your insurance broker to help you make sure that those answers are answered accurately. Yeah, that I think, I think the um, whatever contract you sign, whether it be home and auto or small business insurance, it's a contract. It's a legal contract, and that uh, uh, there's certain things that you need to do, and certain things that the insurance company is uh, going to do. So you have to make sure that they're all in line, and uh, you're, you, you know, what what you say you're doing, you are doing. Yep, thank you for that. Um, and I know we're coming up on time, but another question for the panel to start to wrap it up here. Let's just talk about the claims process briefly for a moment. How does the process typically work once an incident has been reported to the cyber insurance company? Uh, David, do you want to lead us off there? Yeah, so you'll reach out straight away. They'll put you in touch with their cyber breach coach. And from there, you're basically following their instructions. They'll put you in touch with the right people. They'll coordinate with your team. So that's why, to Kevin's point, reach out to them straight away. They'll talk you through all the way through the process. If you feel there, there's no point trying to hide anything. They'll need to get involved. They'll help you. There's no downside to getting them involved in the process. Um, something interesting that people talk to us about is going back to ransomware. Well, how do I know if I'm paying a terrorist or I'm paying an organization that I'm going to get in trouble with the government for paying funds to. So this is an interesting part of the cyber insurance policy that a lot of people don't know about, is they'll actually hire a third party to do the negotiation for you, and it's also that third party's job to do the vetting of the organization, to know if they have any ties to terrorist organizations that you would have an issue if you paid that ransom to. Um, so that's why I would say right away, call your insurance company get the process started, get your breach coach. And then you also have, um, from a liability standpoint, you have someone you can point to that you're working with if the payment goes to a third party. You say, well, I worked based on the professional services. If you get a fine, you can at least have a defense saying, I worked with an expert. They have a vetting process. This is what they said. This is why the payment was made. And then the chances of fines and penalties against you are going to be much slimmer through that process. Excellent point, Kevin. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's, you know, David kind of hit the nail on the head when he said, you know, let's tr try to get those uh, notices in early because, you know, when that, when that, of that incident occurs, you know, really there's, I mean, who are the stakeholders? The stakeholders are yourselves and your, and your internal stakeholders, right? It can be uh, marketing. It can be um, I, obviously IT. It can be, um, you know, C-suite um, and, and other, and other parties within that. And so, you know, when we when we get the uh, the breach coach involved, and, and a lot of the carriers will have a, a panel of vendors. They'll have you know a legal counsel panel, um, which is usually their, your breach coach. They'll have a forensic firm panel. Um, they'll have a panel for um, often for crisis management or PR if you actually do need to do a, a press release or or some sort of you know kind of uh, damage control from a from a uh, publicity perspective. Uh, and so, you know, they'll help walk you through that process. It really sometimes it'll depend on the on the insured. Um, smaller, less sophisticated insureds might not have a team that that is kind of equipped to do some of this stuff. So they rely pretty heavily on the insurance company, and that's fine. The insurance companies, uh, unfortunately, you know, deal with a lot of of these types of events on a regular basis. Um, but other more sophisticated insureds that have bigger teams might want to be more involved in you know, selecting those parties to, to do some of this work. But, you know, one of the advantages of, of the insurance carriers having a panel is is, two, is kind of twofold. One, you don't need to go out and, you know, secure retainers and, um, and do a lot of your own kind of due diligence. Uh, you, you can, certainly, but you don't necessarily have to up front. Um, and, and two, cost, right? And so you have to realize for a lot of these response vendors, you know, insurance companies are repeat customers of theirs, right? Um, so you get, they obviously get more preferential pricing um, just because they know there's going to be repeat business. 
And you know, one of the things that comes up a lot, particularly, you know, I, my mind always goes back to systemic issues. Um, if if you and a hundred other organizations are attacked at the same time, right? Particularly if you're going back to, to ransomware as an example, um, you start worrying in, 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 um, intuitively that, oh well, do these forensic firms have the capacity to be able to handle all of these at the same time? That's a ton of work. Um, one of the advantages of, of some of these, uh, these uh, agreements that they have with the insurance companies is they do get more preferential uh, you know, capacity guarantees that you might not otherwise be able to get kind of on your own. And so, so those are things that, you know, that's when you're going through the process that that can be really helpful um, to know that, hey, we do have access to these firms without having to worry about are they going to be available to us. And when you've done all of that and, and you've responded to the event and, you know, you've done your notifications if, if that's needed, right, if there's a privacy breach, um, the process then goes to, all right, well, is there going to be a claim against us? Is there, is there, or, is there affected population going to sue us? Is, is the, are regulators going to come after us and, and, and launch an investigation? And so that kind of takes the second portion of the claim into, all right, now do we need to hire defense counsel um, to help defend a regulatory investigation or a class action from, cons from our, con our consumers or constituents. And so that's kind of that, that tail end of that. And then, and then last but not least, you know, if we're going back to that ransomware scenario, we've got our potential business income loss, right? Our network is down for a period of time. Um, we, you know, we're not able to uh, conduct our operations and now we've got an impact to the organization. Usually the last piece in the claim and usually where it what can kind of sometimes take the longest is quantifying what that loss might be. Um, and, and, you know, oftentimes you might want to bring in a, a forensic accountant to help kind of go through that process. So, so as, as far as the, the kind of the life cycle, we've got response. To, uh, to defense of, of a regulatory or, or legal action, and then potentially a business income, um, you know, uh, recoupment, if you will, from the insurance company. Yeah, good, thank you. Uh, so we asked the panel a lot of questions today. They provided a lot of great information, but there might be some things we did not get to. So uh, we have a few moments in case anyone would like to come up and ask some questions of our panelists. Uh, good morning. Um, so in, in a case of a ransomware attack, does the cyber liability insurance policy, you know, protect the employee who may have, you know, initiated it through their personal account? You know, um, you know, the, the employee is already looking at possibly losing their job, but could the business then in turn sue that person and pursue some of their financial expenses for the for the claim? I mean, I haven't seen it. Um, you know, so as far as the the insurance policy, so when you're buying from a from a commercial perspective, right? From a commercial insurance perspective, when you're buying a policy, it also protects the employee in their capacity as an employee, right? And so, in other words, if if uh, if their corporate email, for example, becomes compromised because they you know released credentials accidentally or you know kind of uh, took took the bait, if you will. Um, there's not really a there's no repercussion necessarily from the the organization against them. Um, I haven't seen a situation yet that's come up where a personal email is compromised. Then compromised. I, I know it happens. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but um, I haven't seen a situation where an organization's gone back after an employee uh, from a personal perspective. One of the again one of the advantages of having the insurance policy is that you know the thought is you know the policy is meant to make the company whole so there's not even a reason to then go back against the uh, potentially against the employee um, but it doesn't it will not it wouldn't protect the employee in their personal capacity necessarily right because it's I don't know if the homeowners policies would would give them any protection there or not I, I don't tend to work on that type of insurance but yeah. um, but but yeah. generally speaking I mean there is protection for the employee via their employment relationship with the the company yeah and I've never seen the insurer trying to subrogate and recover against that employee to to your point because they're covered as by the definition as an insured as an employee of that organization thank you yeah. also um, you know uh, during a ransomware attack um, you know 
typically your IT team is engaged in either you know stopping the attack and um, you know trying to um, uh, maybe recover you know maybe they're restoring files from backup so uh, is there a point in time uh, where that IT team needs to stop what they're doing by their playbook to make sure that they have evidence or proof that the the attack occurred in case there's extensive damage down the road um, a perfect example uh, the company I worked for in 2016 they did get hit with ransomware we just went to our playbook we restored from backup and we were back up and running and then I had to inform people after the event that hey this is this is what really happened and so you know um, there, we handled it so we wouldn't even have had to have paid our deductible so they wouldn't have filed a claim but had it been bigger than that and extended you know could there be some issues with the IT staff you know performing those types of operations that would impact uh, the success of that claim yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, it, there there could be um, in in the sense that what we always worry about is, uh, especially for, kind of speaking to ransomware more specifically, is all right. Well, your system's down. You might be able to ret restore from backups, but do we initially know if data was compromised, right? If there was a privacy breach, right? That could subsequently result in a more uh, a larger situation, right? As opposed to just restoring the network, which is obviously critically important. Um, so we, we always still encourage early and often reporting mainly because of that. Even if we, know, even if we have a good strong sense from an IT perspective that you know, the, 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 the impact is, is minimal, um, we still want to preserve the ability to, for coverage if there's something else down the road that we didn't know at the onset, right? Um, as far as reporting overall, my general rule of thumb is if before you start incurring particularly external costs, that at the very least, that should be a point where you're like, well, hey, we might want to bring somebody in. Insurance carriers should definitely know at that point. Ransomware is a little bit easier to, to know when to report because it's pretty obvious, right? Our system is locked down. Okay, well, that's a reason to report to the carrier. So I, I would say, especially nowadays, because there's, there's just there's so much more complex than they were five or six years ago, the types of attacks. So I would say, you know, um, if, if you're going to start trying to restore from backups, that's probably a point where you want to get the insurance carrier on the call. They might say, fine, you, if you guys can do it yourselves, that's great. No cost to the insurance company, no cost to you. It's going to be under the deductible. That's, um, that's perfect. But I always worry about preserving coverage for any kind of fall on effect of that that you might not even know, you know at the onset. Thank you. Thank you. And we are at time. If you have more questions for the panel, they might hang around in the room afterwards. But I'm going to bring our room moderator back up to close us out. But thank you so much to our esteemed panel here for uh, the cyber insurance uh, insights today. Thank you all. Thank you. Please remember to complete your surveys before you leave the room. Thank you very much. And I have certificates of appreciation for all our speakers. All right. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm David, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>